guys, welcome back. Second lecture series, uh, which I guess is what I'll be calling these. So I hope the first day went well. Uh, it looked like a lot of you were really comfortable with your flip grids. Um, I haven't been able to look at all of them yet, but the ones that I saw were really fantastic. And now you also get to feel my pain a little bit with how awkward it is to record to your iPad. So anyway, I do want to talk a little bit about the Ministry of Black Veil today. And we will look at some literary definitions like juxtaposition and parable, so on and so forth. Okay, so we start our tale off. First off, actually, let me go back a moment. You're probably seeing some major differences between Poe and Hawthorne at this point. And we'll talk about that a little bit too. So we're moving away from that fantastical element of Poe. And now we're getting into a place that's a little bit more realistic. Okay. Obviously this is hundreds of years from now. Okay. But it's still in real time back then. So the audience could relate more to what Hawthorne was illustrating versus Poe, even though the underlying themes are something that we as the audience can relate to, this whole idea of zombie sisters coming to kill their brothers is something that is a little hard for us to grapple with. So as I said, I'm going to go through my lecture. I think I mentioned this yesterday. I'm going to try my best to keep these lectures under 15 minutes because I know anything longer than 15 minutes can get a little bit boring. So we're going to talk about good old Reverend Hooper, who takes social distancing to a whole different level. And it's kind of odd the way that he starts with this new fashion fad, if you will. Okay, this is a minister who, or a reverend, I'm sorry, who had been in this town for quite a while. People were very familiar with Reverend Hooper. So when he starts to come in with this new black veil, people are very rattled. Okay, and again, think about what black symbolizes, right? We talked about this a little bit with Mask of the Red Death. There's so much symbolism and there's so much negative connotation towards black with the black room and the Mask of the Red Death. And the same thing kind of goes for this black veil, especially for this reverend that's wearing it to preach to church. So as soon as he walks in, the first thing people do is they're talking under their breath, right? Which shows us a little bit about human nature. So from there, Reverend Hooper takes the pulpit and one of the oldest parishioners there doesn't even notice that Reverend Hooper is wearing this veil until he starts talking in front of the congregation. And he's talking in front of the congregation and one thing that sets Reverend Hooper apart from other speakers is that he's very, I don't want to say conversational, but he's not like your Jonathan Edwards, right? He's not all brimstone and fire and you're all going to hell, right? He has a very relatable, he has a very gentle way of speaking to his congregation. But because he's wearing this veil, it's adding a little bit more edge. And ironically, what he's talking about during this sermon is secret sin. Right. So that is the very beginning of him wearing this veil. And we as readers start to see that there's going to be something very symbolic about this veil that he's wearing. As the parishioners are leaving the church, we read this conversation between the physician and his wife. Right. And the wife is wondering, why is Reverend Hooper wearing this black veil? And the physician is saying there's got to be something mentally going on with Reverend Hooper. Like something's not right that he's wearing this black veil. And the wife says, oh, I can't believe that he can be all right with being by himself and alone. It must be so frightening. And the physician admits that, yeah, the scariest moments are when we are by ourselves. Okay, and that's something to think about. Why does the physician say that? What does he mean by that? Okay, that men are often more afraid to be by themselves and with their own souls. Okay, think about that. We'll come back to that. So from there, we start to see the shift in the town. Okay, and as soon as the sermon is over, they start talking about Reverend Hooper's veil, okay? They don't even talk about this amazing sermon he just gave about sermon or secret sin. It's all about 
his clothes. So from there, we move on to the rest of Reverend Hooper's day, okay? And he has to attend a funeral and a wedding, which is a literary term called juxtaposition. So juxtaposition is two contrasting ideas. They can be places or characters, but the most notable aspect of juxtaposition is their stark contrast to one another. And the reason I bring this up is because when Reverend Hooper goes to the funeral, his veil isn't really questioned, right? It's actually a very appropriate, they say it's an appropriate emblem, right? To be wearing to this funeral. And people actually feel soulless in him wearing this, okay? And they say that there's this celestial, um, I forget what word they actually use, but it's this idea that they believe that this person that just died is definitely going to heaven because of him wearing the veil. In fact, two of the people that are at the funeral say that they felt like they saw Reverend Hooper and the dot or the dead person walking hand in hand as if Reverend Hooper is leading them to heaven. Okay, so this this black veil takes on a completely different connotation and persona at the funeral. But then he goes to the wedding and then we see this negative connotation. So we see this stark juxtaposition between the two places he wears the veil. So when he wears this black veil to the wedding, the poor Bride is as white as her own gown, right? And everyone is saying how inappropriate it is for him to be wearing this veil. And he notices himself in the veil when he's lifting up his wine glass, right? To cheers the, ha the happy couple, right? And as soon as he sees himself in the veil, he even scares himself. And he drops the glass of wine and he runs away. So he continues to wear the veil because he's trying to make a statement. And these parishioners in the community can't figure out what this thing is. Okay, what is this message that he's trying to get across? Even though he adamantly doesn't say or admittedly doesn't say what the message is. But instead of the parishioners and the community asking Reverend Hooper why he's wearing this veil, they just continue to conjecture what or why he's wearing it. So they even go as far as to going to the deputies of the church to see if they can't get that or get him to remove the veil. But the deputies are so nervous about this black veil that they won't even ask Reverend Hooper why he's wearing it. The only person brave enough to ask is his wife, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth tries to talk him out of wearing it and he refuses, okay? He is adamant that he is wearing this veil as a point okay so again think about he's talking about secret sin and here's this veil that's covering the physical right and this physical tiny little piece of veil is what's separating him from everybody and that's bringing up that theme of isolation or this idea of isolation i should say so Poor Reverend Hooper, Elizabeth ends up leaving him, right? Because he won't even lift the veil for a minute for her to see his face. And she leaves him because of it. And we also notice with Reverend Hooper that throughout the story, he sadly smiles. So there are three words that I wrote up here that are repeated throughout the story, okay? Carp, emblem, and sadly smiles, okay? And carp, it's just like a thin layer of, it can be silk or um, not polyester, but it's just like a fine, small sheet of fabric, okay? An emblem, I think I mentioned that earlier, being an appropriate emblem, at some points the veil is referred to as a mysterious emblem. So an emblem is a symbol, okay? And this whole sadly smiles, he sadly smiles the first time at the very beginning of the short story when he notices the community talking about the veil. And he's not even asked to dinner after the Sunday service, which is abnormal. Normally after Sunday service, people are crowding around Reverend Hooper to have him over for dinner, but not this time, all because of the veil. So he secretly, or sorry, sadly smiles again when Elizabeth leaves him because this one woman that he loved and had so much faith in lets him down, okay? all over this tiny piece of fabric and he can't make sense of it. Okay, why so many people are drawn to the veil and nothing else and that they are 
getting gossipy and judgmental over a piece of fabric, okay? So we see this development in Reverend Hooper throughout the short story, okay? As it continues on, he goes through this internal conflict, okay? Here he is trying to show that everybody wears a black veil, right? Everybody is guilty of secret sin, okay? Which means if we are all guilty of secret sin, none of us have a right to judge. And that is what Reverend Hooper is trying to get across to this congregation, and they're just not getting it. So he's in this conflict because there is the situational irony here too, right? He's trying to show them this problem with secret sin. Well, the judgment that can come from secret sin, right? But by doing that, he's further isolating himself from his congregation and community and from this one woman that he loves. So poor Reverend Hooper has got to go through some pretty hard conflict himself uh, while he's going through what he considers the right thing. And what ends up happening is he does start to make a name for himself, okay? In fact, he goes from being Reverend Hooper to Father Hooper. People are calling for him on their deathbed because they know, they start to understand that he is representing something even bigger and better, and they want him on their side as they go to meet their maker. They all, or He also starts to become well-known outside of the town, and people from outside of the town are coming in to watch his sermons and they are leaving slightly disturbed once they see his black veil. So he goes on years and years like this, right? And he's never quite fully, what's the word I'm looking for? He does, he still isn't feeling convinced. Oh, I don't want to say convinced. He doesn't feel great that the people react to him the way that they do, right? The children all kind of fly away as soon as he walks in and he hates that, okay? And it's all because of this negative connotation of the color black and the black veil, right? People are convinced that he is hiding something and they are so much more concerned about what he's hiding instead of the actual good person that he is, okay? And even though these people treat him with disdain, he is still kind and giving to these people, okay? He never gets to share in these people's joy and in their health. He only gets to share in their moral discomfort, okay, in their dying time, okay? So he is there for them despite this negative treatment. So we come to Reverend Hooper's dying days, okay, his dying hours. And Elizabeth returns, right? She's at his deathbed. And this young man named Reverend Mr. Clark. And Mr. Clark is trying to have Reverend Hooper remove the veil as he's dying. But Reverend Hooper refuses, right? And it's this idea of Judgment Day. And I should have put this on the board too. So Judgment Day is implied at the very beginning in his sermon of secret sin, but it's also implied with Elizabeth, right? When he says the only person that can, well, the, the only way that my veil can be lifted is essentially on judgment day, right? That God is the only person that can lift this veil for him. And he brings this up finally again with Reverend Clark, okay? He says that the only person that's allowed to judge him and his sins is God, not the people around him, not his wife, not this Reverend Clark, right? Because we are all guilty of secret sin, okay? We all have these sins that we even hide from our lovers, which is what he noticed with Elizabeth, right? Elizabeth, this woman that he's married to, should have accepted what was on his face, okay? He, she should have accepted this secret sin, but she had her own that she was hiding, okay? That Reverend Hooper never really saw that there was this materialistic aspect, okay? that she couldn't move past. So finally, the people start to see, oh, right, that there's this secret sin that we're all hiding and we're all guilty of. And because of that, we shouldn't be anybody's judge. So very sad ending, okay, to the minister's black veil, but he does get his point across at the very end. And he kind of points fingers at the congregation, right? He calls them out. He knows that they have judged him through the past few years, right? And he identifies that he has done so much for this congregation for nothing, 
right? None of them have given him any love, okay? He sacrificed any sort of brotherhood, any sort of relationships, any sort of love, okay? He has physically isolated, isolated himself from society for them to learn that we cannot judge one another. And to some extent, all of us having this secret sin should be bringing us together because in that regard, we're all the same. So that's my food for thought today on the minister's black veil. I'm praying I kept that under 15 minutes. What I would like you to do before we end. So Hawthorne notes that the minister's black veil is a parable. And a parable is a story that shows an underlying message. Okay, it's basically um, meant to illustrate some sort of moral message. So for your flip grid, I want you to answer the question, is the minister's black veil a parable? And if so, how and why? What theme is Hawthorne trying to illustrate by using this as a parable? What about isolation might he be trying to show? What about secret sin or human nature is Hawthorne illustrating through this parable? And maybe you disagree and say, I don't think it is a parable. Maybe it's a cautionary tale. Okay, whatever you think it is, say it and then connect it to the theme. Once you've done that, please reply to two of your other classmates' Flipgrid posts, okay? For homework, you'll also read Dr. Heidegger's experiment, and I will be back here with a lecture about that on Tuesday. So happy reading, guys. Stay safe, stay, safe, stay healthy, stay sane. See you tomorrow.